fish plate and four bolts. And because they're held together like that, they actually have a gap between the rails. All the rails are yep. actually welded over on the top of this one, one nice smooth ribbon of steel. But because of our track, you get a clickety clack sound on the rails as those roads are current passing by. So this is the one that he approaches. We'll also have some more whistles as a path is by the tree. Because we only have three of the cards you can probably do a current time. Oh yeah, don't leave it. On May 10th, 1869, we had 800 people out here, maybe upwards of a thousand. We had two brass bands, the military, locals, workers, representatives of both companies, newspapermen from across the country. We had all these people here. No one remembered to bring a flag to fly over the ceremony. Kind of an embarrassing thing to forget. Well, lucky for us, there was a soldier to the 21st Infantry, which is the first military unit to go from coast to coast by rail, and he had in his pack a family heirloom. And he pulls out a 20 star flag. Ladies and gentlemen, we haven't had 20 states since 1819. That was a 50 year old flag, truly a family heirloom. <coughs> so, in honor of that gentleman, he fly a 20 star flag when we have a look modes out, just like we did for the ceremony in 1869. In conclusion for my program today, a lot of historians like to call this event the wedding of the rails, and I'm sure you folks have been to a few weddings. And you'll probably agree with me that weddings are planned. Usually you have a plan that goes along with a wedding. But for this wedding, we're a random location out in the middle of nowhere for the venue. We have two locomotives that aren't supposed to be here, so we couldn't even get the bride and the groom right for the ceremony. For a floral arrangement, we have a 50 year out of date flag flying over the ceremony. And the golden spike, which is like a wedding ring for the ceremony has the wrong date engraved on it. I like to uh, think of your spouse and think that that would be a problem. So instead of calling this the wedding of the rails, I usually call this the shop on the wedding of the rails. If you know six people who say, you guys are going to try the knot, and you don't care if you're up in the middle of nowhere, or if it's a really convenient easy to get to location. Now a little bit about our work motives. They were both built 1979 by a plumber engineering. The originals kind of scrapped in the early 20th century. Uh, the owner of the 
company, Chadwick Conner, was a huge fan of steam locomotives. And even though his company primarily makes uh, camera mounts, when the chance came up to build these, he jumped at that chance. And that's where both of these came from. Perhaps some more whistles as the 119 approaches, and one last whistle when it stops here at the last fight site. Welcome to the Uniform Locomotive Ranger Program. I'll be assisted today by several of our best volunteers and park rangers out here. And, uh, oh, let's see, volunteer uh, Miles over here, that guy, he's going to be keeping us safe. I also have uh, Park Ranger Val and Park Ranger Bailey over there to assist me. I'd like to thank you for coming out to our park today. Eventually we're going to run these locomotives, uh, but I'll talk for a little bit. When we run the locomotives, we'll start with the Jupiter first. It's going to back up, then it's going to come forward, and it's going to park right here. The 119, on the other hand, is going to back up, switch tracks, come in on the siding, which is that track over by the visitor center. Then it's going to back up, switch tracks, and come back in on the main line. When we operate on the locomotives, we have you stay 15 feet back from the track, which is about where I'm at, that barrel, the uh, table, the red hand on the crosswalk, or the uh, railroad ties out in the field. And I'll also try and give you folks a heads up with the locomotive if you're going to blow this whistle, uh, in case you have pets, small children, or offensive here. So I'd like to take this opportunity to explain why you're all out here in this really convenient, easy to get to location today. As you're driving 30 miles off the interstate, you're asking yourself why. Why on earth did they complete the Transcontinental Railroad in the middle of nowhere? And in 1869, this was really the middle of nowhere. Well, it all goes back to the Pacific Railway Act of 1862, signed by President Abraham Lincoln. And in this act, there are a lot of very specific details about this railroad. It mentions that two companies are going to build it. You're going to have the Central Pacific building from Sacramento, California, which is just behind that mountain, plus 690 miles. And then you'll have the Union Pacific building from Omaha, Nebraska, which is 1,086 miles that way if you're walking. The two companies will build towards each other, and they're going to get paid by a mile of track. They're going to get $16,000 a mile for building on the plains, $48,000 a mile for building in the mountains, and if that's not enough, they're going to get 12,000 acres of land for every mile of track that they build. And they own the mineral and timber rights for that land. 
The track itself is going to be standard gauge. That means the distance between the rails is four feet eight and a half inches. And that's still what we use today. And then the, uh, the grade of the track, or how steep it is, will be no more than 2%. That means for every 100 feet you go forward, you can't climb or descend more than two feet. So lots of very specific details in this act about where these companies are building from, how they're being compensated, the dimensions of the railroad. But there's one piece of information that's missing, and that is where are these two companies supposed to meet and finish this railroad? Now, the original Railroad Act called for the Central Pacific to build for the California-Nevada border and stop. But they knew that they didn't want to do that. They wanted to build them to Nevada, Utah, and maybe even into Wyoming. So they started working on some amendments to figure out, uh, to allow the companies to build more. And one of those amendments allowed them to build until their tracks physically met. Another amendment allowed them to build railroad bed or rail grades, which is that earthen mound that you have the track on, up to 300 miles in front of where they are laying tracks. And they get a partial payment in the form of a government bond for building railroad grades. And then they get the rest of the money when they got track on it in a past inspection. So at some point in the construction of this railroad, the two grading crews from the two companies met each other. And then they waved at each other. And then folks, there was no adult supervision at this meeting, so they just kept on building past each other for a couple miles. About 250 miles, actually. So I'd like to welcome you to a national park brought to you by just a little bit of government fraud, just a teeny tiny little bit. By 19th century standards, this is probably pretty tame. So Congress pulled up in April of 1869. Keep in mind, this was completed in May. And they said, hold on a second, time out. You guys need to figure out where to meet. So they called a meeting in Washington. Both companies sent a representative to this meeting. And for adult supervision, Congress sent one of their own. They sent Congressman Samuel Hooper from Massachusetts. And his job was to be an unbiased representation of the American government and its people. To have your interest at the forefront of the conversation and make sure everything is above table for a change. And you know what? He was probably completely unbiased because he owns stockable companies. So he's got nothing to lose. He's got nothing to worry about. <laughs> the two companies pulled out the map and they estimated that their track crews would finally bump into each other in one month in this location. So that's why they selected this really convenient, easy to get to place to complete the railroad. Now, when they completed the railroad here, there's speculation that the town of Promontory Summit, Utah Territory, which are all residents of at the moment, was going to become a major railroad hub. People were speculating that tracks were going to branch out in all directions from this location across the American West. And one newspaper in 1869 even called this place the future Chicago of the West. And as you clearly see... Well, I'm working on that. Um, I'm thinking a golf course over here, maybe some like high-rise condos. Still working on it. So the reason why this never developed into much of a town is we lack the resource that locomotives and people need to survive. What do you think that is? You're right, Wi-Fi. I'm also working on that. Uh, no, you're right. So, 1869, this was a dry town. They sunk the well down to about 70 feet and could not get any water. Our well today goes down about 400 feet, so you really have to want water here to get it. So imagine you're traveling west on the Transcontinental Railroad, you get to this place, which is the railhead for these two companies, and you get off the Union Pacific train, and then you have to wait for the Central Pacific train to come and pick you up. These two companies did coordinate their timetables initially. You could be waiting out, uh, out here upwards of 23 hours for the next train to come through. This is a hard layover place. So you're in a waterless town in the middle of nowhere with just lots of sage brush and rattlesnakes for entertainment. The two companies realized that this was not a promising business solution for hitting off passengers, especially if they're paying you. So the Central Pacific bought the rights to the rail from here down to Ogden in November of 1869. And starting in December, Ogden became the hub for the two companies. Because Ogden has water, they have buildings not made out of canvas, and they have a lower rattlesnake population than we do. So a lot of positive things going on in Ogden. 
It's not to say this town dried up and went away. Uh, this was a watering station for the locomotives. Eventually, we did get water here. But in 1904, something happens. They build another line to the south of us. And it's called the Lucin Cutoff. And it's a trestle that goes right across the Great Salt Lake. It's 44 miles shorter. It's flat. There's maybe four turns in the whole thing. And it's a really, really quick way to get across Utah. As soon as they put that line into operation, we go from 10 trains a day on this track to three trains a week. Then in 1942, a coal goes out across the nation, full unused rail to get pulled for the war effort. We have over 100 miles of track here in northern Utah that's barely being used, so they yank up all of this track in the summer of 42. And then when the Park Service got this site in the mid-1960s, we put back two miles of track. So what you see is what we have today, and our track actually doesn't connect anything. And we're going to start our locomotive program by using some of that track. So I'm going to give these guys the right away to move on the track. The term is called highball. It goes back to the early days of railroading when they would hoist a wooden ball of a flagpole. And that was a signal to the engineer that he had the right away to move on the track. All right, folks, you might want to cover up your ears. Jupiter, you have the highball. Sierra Nevada Mountains, a feat which many people thought impossible in the 19th century. So they got the antelope all ready, it was coming here to Promontory, and it was bringing the president of the Central Pacific Railroad here for the ceremony, and that would be the former governor of California, Leland Stanford. Well, the antelope was what we call a special run train. It was not on the original published schedule. So the train that it was following was flying green flags on the front of it. If you see a train with green flags and green lights on the front of it, it's telling you there is an unscheduled train behind me. So do not go back onto the tracks. The line is not clear yet. Well, there are a bunch of workers in the Sierra Nevada mountains who are actually working on the railroad. It has been lost to history whether or not they were singing the song. But personally, I like to believe that they were. Anyway, they saw that first train go by. But they didn't catch that it was flying green flags. And these guys went right back to work. And they were actually chopping down trees to make railroad ties. And they had a, and rolling logs across the track. And they had a nice big log right across the track, just in time for the president of their company to crash right into it. Effectively making the antelope a train wreck. So when they got into the next station, they needed the first available locomotive. And it just happened to be the Jupiter. Now, if you look down on the Jupiter right now, it's doing what's called a blowdown. It's not a dance move, I thought it was. Uh, what he's doing is he's venting the bottom of the boiler and blowing steam out the side. So any debris or contaminants that have built up in the boiler over time, they'll blow that out to the side. If you look down there very, very carefully, you'll also see something unique. You'll see the cleanest safe brush in the entire National Park Service, because we steam clean it every day, sometimes twice. Now this is one of the best shots in the whole park. As you look down there, we're very fortunate in that nothing really has been built out here in 153 years. So with the right setting on your phone, you can almost tell people that you have a photograph from 1869. We'll have some more whistles as the Jupiter approaches the switch. And one last whistle when it stops here at the site. <laughs>
questions for this run. Uh, two big differences between these locomotives. One, what fuel they burn. The Jupiter is wood fired, and the 118 runs on coal. And the reason for the difference is geography. Uh, what does California have a lot of? You're right, traffic. Uh, they also have fish tacos, avocados, ruby stars. They got a lot of great things in California. They don't have a lot of coal. They don't look more it's going to be wood fire, even though coal is a much more efficient fuel. Union Pacific, on the other hand, they had access to all of the coal on the East Coast. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, these guys were giving land as they were building the railroad. And a lot of that land in southern Wyoming is loaded with coal. And so they're able to actually use coal mines out west to support their locomotives. The other difference between the two machines is what they were built to do. The Jupiter was built as a passenger locomotive, and the 119 was built for freight. And you can see the difference in the size of the drive wheels. If you look at the wheels in the middle, on the Jupiter, they're about 8 inches larger in diameter than they are on the 119. This gives Jupiter a better top end speed, but lower torque. It can't pull quite as much weight as the 119. Another interesting difference is the, uh, the smokestack. So it's always the one that people catch on to. Uh, with the Jupiter uh, and the 119, they both have a spark arresting system on them, but they're in slightly different places. On the smokestack of the Jupiter, it's actually up in that funnel. There's a big bell in that funnel that catches burning embers before they go up and aft and out and set fire to everything else out here. And now on 119, the, the smoke box, which is the foremost area on the engine, the part here with the rivets on it, it's a little bit longer than the Jupiter, and that's because there's a bunch of grates in there that do the same thing. All right, folks, why don't we cover up ears? 119, you have the highball.